God's going to use our pastor, pray that he is going to, you know, bless the hearts of people and, and just keep it. Because, you know, the devil is always there to pull you down and to pray and that he will be strengthened. You know, uh, I read someplace that um, resentment is it's, 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 it's a terrible thing. You must have pureness of heart. And even as we accept the word of God, let's, even if we think it's rough or hard on us, it's all for our goodness. And um, it, it is said that it is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Praise the Lord. And uh, as we go into the song, let's just keep our minds clear and open. Praise the Lord. Let's all stand as we say, 219, surely the presence of the Lord is in this day. Music. Into the deep. 
And it came to pass, Luke 5, 1 through 11, please. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Sorry for jumping the gun on you. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Pastor Lloyd says he understands. Luke chapter 5. Verses 1 through 11. When you're there, say Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. And when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night, and we have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships, so that they began to sink. When Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And he was astonished. And all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also Jesus and John, the sons of Zebedee which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. And the title this morning is taken from verse 4. Launch out into the deep. Launch out Hallelujah. into the deep. Launch out into the deep. Get out of the shallow water. Stop waiting for the fish to come to you. Go and get them. I suppose if we all had one desire in common, it would be this morning to be used of God for his glory. Sometimes that seems so out of reach. We feel as though we are not qualified or that we don't have enough Bible knowledge or spiritual maturity. What kind of people does God use? If there was ever a person who was surprised that God not only called him into his service, but did indeed use him in a powerful way. It was a first century fisherman from Galilee known as Simon Peter. Peter was introduced to Jesus by his brother Andrew. When Jesus met him, he changed his name from Simon to Peter from Simon Barjona, from Simon son of John. And that's interesting this morning. From Simon son of John, Simon Barjona, you know, yesterday I was telling the folks in here that my surname has changed. So if my blood brothers don't want to follow Jesus, I don't have to hang around them. Because my surname is not Clark anymore. My surname is Ray Son of God. 
Hallelujah. Son of God. So I don't have to hang around my blood relatives if they don't want to follow Jesus. And I can tell you that I speak it and I mean it. Amen. Amen. If they don't want to follow Jesus. Jesus changed Peter's surname. From Simon Barjona. Simon, son of John. To Simon Peter. To Simon Peter. To Simon Peter. He changed his name. To Peter. In John chapter 1. Verses 40 to 42. One of the two which heard John speak. And followed him was Andrew. Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas. Why the name change? Simon means a reed. A reed is a grass-like plant that grows very tall in swampy areas. And it is jointed. It has joints like a sugar cane. But it, it grows tall. And it has joints. It is not a very strong plant. So Simon means a reed. Here was a man blown by the winds. As if he's in the swamp of public opinion. And shaken in his beliefs by the pressures of others. But Jesus saw something more in him. So he called him Peter. Meaning a rock. You are no more a blade of grass being blown in the wind of public opinion or being pressured by others, but you are now a rock. A rock. Hallelujah. Well founded. Well planted. A rock. Can't be blown around by the wind. A rock. One who would be strong and steadfast in his loyalty to Jesus and his commitment to the call of God. You can't let even your relatives pressure you out of serving God. God must come first in the hierarchy of your life. Nobody must be able to pressure you out of serving God. And you know what? The devil used those closest to you to put on the pressure. Put on the pressure. But you have to have the discernment to say absolutely not, Satan. I would rather serve Jesus. His journey with Jesus was one of being transformed from a reed, from a grass to rock. His journey began one day with an encounter with Jesus by the Sea of Galilee. Peter had grown up and still lived in the town of Capernaum located on the northern tip of the sea. The Sea of Galilee is about 13 miles long by 8 miles wide at 680 feet below sea level, giving it an almost tropical setting. During Jesus' time, there were nine townships around the Sea of Galilee, 
with a population of about 15,000 people. Peter was in the fishing business with his brother Andrew. They were partners with their close friends James and John. On this day in question, these fishermen had just spent a top night fishing, yet failed to catch anything. They were tired and frustrated. Around the shoreline, a crowd had gathered. The new controversial teacher, which some were saying was the Messiah, was preaching the word of God. Simon listened from a distance. Jesus had started his preaching in the synagogues, where he built in the synagogues. Synagogues were built in every town. Every Jewish town and city had a synagogue. Jews gathered each Sabbath for worship, prayer, the reading, and the exposition of the scripture, and for fellowship. The synagogue served during the week as schools. And one of Jesus' first sermons was delivered in the nearby town of Nazareth, where he had grown up. He went into the temple and he turned to the book of Isaiah and he began to read, For he hath anointed me to preach the gospel. But Jesus was not restricted to ministering in the synagogues. The world was his parish. The countryside his sanctuary. Every man's heart was his pulpit. And after addressing the crowd that day, Jesus noticed Simon, his companions, along with their boats on the shoreline. And he asked Peter to use his boat so he could address the people offshore. Jesus had to be Jesus to do that. Because this morning I was asking Sister Chotilal to speak up a little louder. We have amplification, but there are people in here who can't hear us. And you wonder if people hear sometimes, even if you turn the mic all the way up. Some people just come to church, but they don't hear a word. Because it doesn't suit them. So they don't hear a word. Can you imagine Jesus stepped in the boat and he said to Peter, get off the shore a little bit for me, for I want to preach. Have you ever been by the beach? In order for somebody to hear you, you have to yell. Because the sea, the waves are coming in. There is always that noise in the atmosphere. People are on the beach. There was a big crowd. And Jesus said, Peter, get the boat off the beach a little bit for me. Because I got to preach to these people. Wow. What a mighty God. What a mighty God. He began to preach. And after he had announced and noticed that they were there. Jesus said to Peter, I want to make an unusual request of you, Peter. Launch out into the deep. Because I want to preach to you now. I just finished preaching to the crowd, Peter. I don't know if you heard me. But I want you to take me to deep sea where I can talk to you. Hallelujah. Did he merely mean the deep waters of Galilee? Not really. He was calling Simon into deeper waters with God. He 
was calling him to an adventure of faith with him. He wanted to use Simon only for his glory. Jesus challenges you this morning. Yes. Launch out into the deep. There is more to life than fishing. There is more to life than the pleasures of this world. There is more to life than the pursuit of power. There is more to life than the achievement of fame. The accumulation of wealth, big wardrobes. There is more to life than going through the daily routine of eating and drinking and sleeping and waking, working and resting, making money, preparing for retirement. There are deep waters in God. That you must pursue. That will fill your life. With eternal purpose. I was going through my wardrobe this week. And I found some clothes that I hoped would fit me. And I kept hoping and hoping. And I'm attached to them so I'm hoping this is a nice suit. One day it will fit me. Hallelujah. And I just got mad. And I said, I give up on you. And I took them down. And I piled them up. I got mad. We get so attached to what is not significant. You know, one day I was at work in Jamaica and I heard a girl look at a guy as he drove his VW bug well decked out and as he uh, disembarked from it and he walked toward the income tax building and as he was going up the steps, this woman just shook her head and said, that's mess dressed up. <laughs> Life is more than the possession of things. God wants to use us. And if we must have an eternal purpose, we must surrender our will to God. Number one, God wants to use some ordinary people. A fisherman, a common man. Acts chapter 4 verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. But hear what they said. They took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Jesus uses the simple things of the earth to confound the wise. This was one of the distinctive features of Jesus as a rabbi. Traditionally, parents would save up enough money and then seek out a rabbi to teach their son whom they wanted to study the law of God. Not so with Jesus. He sought out his followers. And he was no respecter of persons. To the Pharisees he said, The tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. Matthew 21, 31 says, Whether of them twain did he did the will of his father, they said unto him, the first, Jesus said unto him, unto them, Verily I say unto you, the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Amen. 
simple people. You know, I heard a preacher came to our church in Jamaica many years ago and he was preaching. And he said he, some prostitutes, he was from Philadelphia and he said in where his church was, there were a lot of prostitutes. And he had a week of crusade and some of these prostitutes came in and they got saved. He said the problem was they needed new clothes, but they came to church every Sunday in the same clothes they used to wear to attract men on the street. And they would come and they would sit in the front pew. And he said, to tell you the truth, as I look upon them, I say, Lord, I lift my eyes unto the hills. From winds cometh my help. One sister came to him and said, uh, Brother Oswald, if, if it were me, I would drive these terrible people out of my church. She said, you have a problem. It's not that they are terrible. It's because they're beautiful. He said, leave them alone, sister. The Holy Spirit is going to te teach them. The Holy Spirit is going to teach them how to dress. God is going to provide money for them so they can buy new modest dresses. They're going to learn. You can't drive people out of church because you don't like that. God will fix that. Just keep on praying for that. God will fix that. God will fix that. If they desire to be fixed, God is going to fix them. And Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven have more prostitutes and have more harlots than it had Pharisees. Here are three lessons, great lessons that we should learn. Jesus initiates the search. Jesus initiates the search. And God is still in the searching business. The shepherd had nine, a hundred sheep. One had left the pole. The shepherd left the pole and went in search of one. There were 90 and 9 that safely lived. But one was out on the hills far away. And the shepherd counted his sheep. And one was missing. And he went out and searched for that one. God is searching for you this morning. God came to the garden of Eden and Adam was not where he was supposed to be. <laughs> and the word Adam there does not just mean the man Adam. The word Adam means humankind. God came and Adam was not where he was supposed to be. And God said, Adam, where art thou? I'm searching for you. Where are you? Luke chapter 19 verse 10 says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. The second lesson is, Jesus loves us. Just like we are. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus loves every one of you just the way you are. Just as I am without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me. 
And that thou bids me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Jesus wants you just as you are. If you could pick yourself, you would have done it already. But you can't do it. Come with all your burden. Come with all your sin. Come with everything everybody else doesn't like about you. Come to Jesus as you are. He died for you as you are. Hallelujah. He knew me. Yet he loved me. He knew what a wretch I would be. But he loved me. Just as I was. Thirdly. Jesus takes what we have. And uses it for his glory. I have an acronym for you. This acronym does not mean obesity. Jesus loves fat people. Jesus loves fat people. Jesus wants fat people. People who are faithful. People who are available. People who are teachable. People who are faithful. People who are available. People who are teachable. F A T. Will you be a fat person for Christ? Hallelujah. Would you like to become a fat person for Christ? Would you like to be one who is faithful? One who is available. One who is teachable. You have to be humble to fall into that category. God loves persevering people. Perseverance is greater than resource and ability. A member of this church told me a week and a half ago, Reverend Clark, I don't know how you do it. But you encourage my heart. Because I can't understand how come you have not given up. I'm a fisherman. I am a fisherman. Perseverance is greater than resource and ability. Peter was tired. They had fished all night and had caught nothing. He was tired. He was frustrated. He was broke. Listen to me now. Fishermen live day to day. They go out at night, they come in, they sell the fish in the morning, they feed their family. They go out all night. They caught 
nothing. The effort failed. But he was willing to go back out and try again. He was a man of great perseverance. Hear me this morning, Global. Last week I got up and my wife said, don't bother with these things till after Easter. But you see, I am a man of God. I said to Brother Wright, my wife don't know what I'm here doing. took the pulpit downstairs and I said I'm going to rebuild it. We're going to make over this church and we're going to do what God has called us to do because the church looked like people have given up on it. But I have not given up on Jesus. I have not given up on Jesus. See, I know if my wife get to heaven and she's in front of me when Peter said, come in, she ain't looking back. You know, I'm going to look back to see if I was following. She's going straight in. So when the Holy Spirit speaks to me, I can't make her tell me nothing else to do but what the Holy Spirit has told me to do. It's not about my wisdom. It's about God's wisdom. I'm not going to hide it from her. But I'm going to do what God tells me to do. And there is no power on earth. God going to turn me back. There's no hunger, no nakedness, no thirst will make me turn back from doing what God wants me to do. And I don't sit down and wait on anybody to come. That's Brother Wright. He comes in the morning, I'm here working already. I'm doing what God has called me to do. I'm going to persevere. Because what's the worst thing it can do? Make me live longer. Because if it puts me to sleep here, I enter right into eternity. You might say it kill me. Live again. But if it puts me to sleep here, I enter right into eternity. For to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Last year I had the opportunity to go fishing with my son. My wife and my daughter booked the boat and everything and we traveled to Staten Island to go fishing. There's one thing I learned about fishing. You have to cast the line more than one time. Fishermen are patient people. They are a persevering breed of people. A good fisherman always go back to the same waters that discouraged him. And he tries again. Went last night, he caught nothing. 
but he's, he comes back with his net, put it back together, says we're going back out there tonight. And no, there is fish out there. Gone back to the same place. We were on the boat and the boat went away and the guy came back and he said, pull up line. And he went back straight to where he had gone before. Because he believed fish is there. When God send you fishing, don't give up because the first message didn't win any soul. But keep going back to the same water. You must persevere. That's why I persevere. Because God called me to fish for men. So if you don't understand how I do it, that's what I am. A fisherman. God uses obedient people. One of the greatest faith statements in the Bible is found in this passage of Luke chapter 5. In verse 5. Nevertheless, hallelujah, Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down my net. Nevertheless. If there's one word you must put in your vocabulary today is the word nevertheless. It means in spite of doubt. In spite of discouragement, in spite of disillusionment, in spite of the failures of others, in spite of personal attacks, in spite of personal failure, I will let down my net. There's no powers on the God earth is going to stop me from obeying Jesus. Because you said so, Jesus, I will let down my net. Nevertheless, Lord, we were same place here last night. We were right here last night. We caught nothing. Nevertheless. <laughs> Nevertheless at your word. I'm going to try again. I'm going to let down my net. I should have stopped a long time ago, Jesus. I should have sell the boat and the net. I should have sell the last hook I have and sink. I've been here many times, Jesus. <laughs> Folks are saying they don't know why I try. One young man was here, he said, after what I hear those people say about you, I don't even know why you bother. I told him because I wasn't called by those people. <laughs> I was not called to preach by those people. I was not called to pastor by those people. I was called by Jesus and as long as he is with me, I am going to let down the net. Amen. 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 
Nevertheless, at his word, I'm going to let down the net. Nevertheless, Lord, yesterday we went up to the plaza. Nobody listened to us. Nevertheless, I believe you sent me there. And I'm going back today. Lord, last week we gave out coffee. And nobody come to church. But nevertheless. <laughs> nevertheless. Lord, I don't like how some people treat me. When I go to church. But that's where you send me. And if you send me there. Nevertheless. Nevertheless, some of us expect too much. You know. We just expect too much. You know, I, I live my life not expecting much of it. That's why I don't get disappointed. You know. Because when you fail, I ain't going with you. Amen. So I'm not sitting here hoping everybody is going to be alright. Everybody's going to do the right thing. No. I'm going to wake up and do what God has called me to do. Nevertheless. God wants us to be humble. God uses humble people. Humility simply means to recognize your need of God. To recognize that we need God. Look at Peter's honest Heart in verse 8 of Luke chapter 5. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. <laughs> I'm not worthy to be in your presence. I'm not worthy. I need you more than you need me. I need you, Lord. A mark of all God's servants in the Bible is humility. Abraham says, I am nothing but dust and ashes. In Genesis chapter 18 verse 27. Jacob said, I am less than the least of all your mercies. In Genesis 32.10. Job said, I repent and I abhor myself. In Job 42, verse 6. Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am undone. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5. Paul said, I am the chief of sinners and least of the apostles. First Timothy 
chapter 1 verse 15 says this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 9 says for I am the least of the apostles that I am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. John Bradford the faithful martyr, martyr for Christ used the sign used to sign some of his letters with these words. Instead of saying yours truly or yours faithfully, he would say, say a most miserable sinner, John Bradford. Humility before God transforms us into servants to others. Humility means you relinquish your desire to rule over others. You relinquish the desire to control and to dominate and to intimidate and to exercise authority. The disciples often got caught up in the quest for power. Lord, when you come into your kingdom, will you let me sit on your right hand and my brother sit on your left? They often discuss among themselves who among us is the greatest. Jesus knew their thought at one time and Jesus said if any of you would be great let him be servant of all. If any of us would be great let us be like Francis of Assisi. Let us be servant of all. Let us be like Jesus, who came not to serve to be served, but to serve. Lastly, God uses visionary people. Christ gives Peter a vision of what he can be and what he can do for the kingdom of God. Do not be afraid, Peter. Get up. You think this is great, Peter? You think these two boat loads of fish is anything? You're going to catch men. You are going to catch men. I will make you a fisher of men. Verse 10 of chapter 5 of Luke. So Peter is no more a reed. That the wind is blowing in the swamp. But he is now a rock with a vision. He is a rock with a vision. Vision inspires loyalty. When the pastor has a vision, don't be divisive. Don't come up with division. But follow the vision. 
Hallelujah. Because the vision destroys the vision. Amen. Follow the vision. Let nothing stop you. Because the vision came from God. Vision inspires loyalty. The Bible says they left everything. They did not abandon their family. But Mrs. Peter knew what Peter was about. He was not going to be home for many nights and days, but he's coming back home. And she was with the vision because she said, if you got to go, you got to go. Because the Lord has called you, I will not stand in your way. God knows the fish used to be on the table. God knows he used to sell some of the fish and buy bread. But Jesus has given you a vision. So follow him. I join you in this loyalty. They went with Jesus. They traveled with him on ministry tours. And they returned home uh, from time to time to see how family was doing. They followed him. The consummate word of discipleship is follow. That's what discipleship means. To follow. To follow. Norman Vincent Poole told, Peel told the story of a friend who grew up very poor in Midwestern city. And his father told him he could only go through the lower grades and then he would have to go to work to help support the family. One day he was walking down one of the main business streets of the city where he lived and he passed the newspaper office and saw a man sitting behind a desk with his coat off, his vest unbuttoned, his tie loose, his sleeves rolled up and the young boy was struck immediately as though he was transfixed. And he asked the policeman at the corner, who is that man? The man replied, the officer, is the editor of the newspaper and he's just about the most powerful influential in all this area. How did he get that job? The boy asked. I don't know. He probably worked for it, the officer answered. Right then the boy envisioned himself as the editor of the paper. The image was formed in his mind. He had no doubt about it at all. That was going to be his future and he went to work. At first he got a job delivering paper. Then he got on one of the trucks that took the papers out. Next he moved into the advertising department and advanced very rapidly. But this wasn't the normal path that led to the editorial chair. The day came when the editor's position became open. And the publisher called him in and said, Roger, I don't know why I'm going to make you this offer. You are the best advertising man we've ever had. But I have an overwhelming feeling that you were intended to be the editor of this paper. 
So I appoint you editor in chief. Thank you, sir. Roger said. But God gave me the job years ago. The publisher listened in astonishment to Roger's story. He had a dream of what he could be and it came to pass. That day on the shoreline of Galilee, Peter caught a glimpse of the man he could be in Christ Jesus and it came to pass. Amen. The crux of the matter is this. Amen. They left everything and they followed him. How are you following him today? Are you like Caleb? But my servant Caleb because he had another spirit with him and had followed me fully, him will I bring into the land wherein to he went, and his seed shall possess it. Are you like Peter at the crucifixion in Luke chapter 22, 54? Then they took him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house and Peter followed afar off. Are you like the disciples? John 6, 66 says, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Are you like David? In Psalm 63, verse 8, My soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. Christ is calling to you today. Launch out into the deep. God bless you. vision of people. You know, and but for us to really plug in, we have to be humble. You know, the world wants us to follow their ways and do things to keep up with the Joneses and who's in. Because if we're not in with them, we're out. But we know, yeah, following Jesus has never been. Never been. But God always makes a way. Humble your heart that you may see the vision and follow God's way and become the person God has in store for you. That's great news. Thank you, Reverend. That's great news. That's great news for young and for old. And, you know, that's a really a word for the day as we come through Lent. You know, we may be going through some tough times right now in this season. We may not feel well. We may not want to get up out of bed sometimes. Hallelujah. But better times to come. Yes, sir. God got the vision. Don't worry about the popular people, young people. Hallelujah. Don't worry what's doing with the in crowd. Hallelujah. God got the vision for you. Hallelujah. Our invitational hymn, number 485 in your hymnal, Into My Heart. into my heart.
of the naysayers. Leave the shallow waters of bad influence. Mm. Leave the shallow waters where people who mean you no good have access to you. Mm. Get out into the deep with Jesus. Hallelujah. And he will tell you where to let down your net. My sister, step forward. Into the boat with Jesus. Mm. She's ready to try again. Jesus. She's going back to fish where she fished before. Because one boat can't hold the fish. Mm. Two boats can't hold the fish. Thank you. That's a waiting. Mm. Let us pray. Hallelujah. Eternal God and our heavenly Father. Thank you. We thank you today for your love and your mercy. Thank you. We thank you, Lord God, for a soul that trusts you, that is willing to launch out into the deep. Hallelujah. Thank you. And to say, I'm going fishing with Jesus. Mm. Because God, if you say, let down the net, we can't hold it. Mm -hmm. You said, it's going to be pressed down, shaken up. Lord God, it's going to be so much that we can't contain it. So it is going to flow over into others. God, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you give Sister Malcolm the desires of her heart today. Mm. God, whatever is holding her on the shore, I ask you to let her let it go and get into that boat and launch out into the deep. Sometimes it's just you and us, God, in that boat. There's nobody else with us. But nevertheless, nevertheless, at your word, we're going to cast down our names. God, in the name of Jesus, grant Sister Malcolm the desire of her heart. Help her to be obedient to you. Yes. Help her to be humble before you. Hallelujah. Help her to be God to be persevering before you. Yes. Help her, Lord God, as she let down the net. Hear us, we pray. We thank you, thank you for hearing our prayers as we stand in agreement with our sister. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. God bless you, sister. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our recessional hymn in your hymnals, number 235. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There will be no 6 p.m. service this evening as Pastor Lloyd is not feeling strong as yet and he's still obeying his doctor's orders and resting up. 
so everybody needs a rest sometimes. So we're not going to have any 6 p.m. service this evening. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Number 235, take the name of Jesus with you. Take the name of Jesus with you. of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forevermore Take Jesus with you and have a blessed week.